So Exodus chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 15. Pretty, pretty popular passage, but we'll help refresh our memory and then maybe help us pull some things out. Exodus chapter 2, verse number 1. This is after uh, the oppression has begun. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Why was she hiding him? Because Pharaoh, in verse number 22 of chapter 1, he charged all the people to take the babies and to throw them into the river or to kill them uh, in whatever way that is. So, in verse number 2, we see that uh, this uh, Levite lady and her husband have a son. They see that he's a goodly child and they hide him three months. Verse number 3, and when she could no longer hide him, I don't know how she couldn't hide a little toddler baby, maybe from all the noise that they make. Verse number 3, when she could hide him, no, uh, no longer hide him, she took him. Uh, uh, took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it with the flags by the river's bank, brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done with to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it and saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then, uh, then said uh, his sister, Moses' sister, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother perfect person to take care of this child would be the child's mother. Verse number nine, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse it for me and I will give thee, give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. So she's getting paid to take care of her own child. Verse number 10, and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. That Hebrew word Moses means drawn out or drawn near. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. So it gives the explanation for the name Moses. The name Moses literally means drawn or drawn out. Verse number 11, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Here he's probably between 30 and 40 years old. That he went out to his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the second day. Behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto him that did wrong, Wherefore smitest thy fellow? Why are you guys fighting? You're both Hebrews. Why are you guys fighting? Verse number 14. And he said, I have this underlined, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Verse number 15, And when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So here, in these 15 verses, we see the birth of Moses how Moses was put into the basket, floated down the river. Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses, has compassion on this Hebrew baby, needs somebody to take care of the baby for him, so hires Moses' mother to take care of the child. Moses is then adopted, becomes Pharaoh's son, grows up in Pharaoh's household. He comes out his first two days on the job. Day one, he kills an Egyptian, and day two, he is found out. And then Pharaoh uh, finds out and he becomes angry with Moses and Moses has to flee to the desert. So here in these 15 verses, we see the first 40 years about of Moses' life, how he was born, raised, and then eventually had to flee. In these first 15 verses of Exodus 2, it is obvious the miracles and the direction for Moses' life from the Lord. Five things I see. Moses being born 
and being hid for three months was a miracle because it was instructed that any child, male child that was born, was supposed to be killed immediately. So it was just a miracle that he was born and lived three months without being found. Then we have a three-month-old baby floating down the Nile River alive. That's also a miracle. It's just like a floating snack for a crocodile, but he was protected. So then miracle number three I see is an Egyptian lady, Pharaoh's daughter in particular, spares the life of a Hebrew baby, which is, that would go 100% against what the orders were as an Egyptian, much less Pharaoh's own daughter. That's a miracle. Then we have Pharaoh's daughter hires a Hebrew woman to raise a Hebrew baby. Also a miracle. And then we have a Hebrew boy growing up and being adopted in the, in the house of Pharaoh. Pharaoh literally made a law that all Hebrew boys need to be killed, yet a Hebrew boy becomes part of his family. That the, uh, there is no odds of that happening. The odds are zero. The only way that happens is a miracle. So I see five miracles just in the first 10 verses of Exodus 2. All these things are miracles in and of themselves, and it's very evident that God orchestrated each one of these factors in the life of Moses. By the time Moses is grown, where we see Moses comes out, of the house, the house of Pharaoh, and he sees what's going on. It's, I'm not sure what Moses' foreknowledge was of knowing how the Lord was going to use him or what his exact purpose was, but we know that Moses, based on his actions and his zeal and compassion for his people, Moses understood that he was spared and raised in the house of Pharaoh for a particular reason. That's obvious. Uh, he knew where he came from. He knew how he got to where he was and the condition of his people. And he had obviously a passion. He couldn't, not even one day. It wasn't, oh, he went out day after day and he saw them get afflicted and then he acted. He was out there one day and he knew this isn't right. I'm going to do something about it. Okay, however, <clears throat> here is where we're going to draw the lesson. Moses took action before God gave him direction. Moses took action before God gave him direction. We are going to be talking about leaving in patience in Egypt. In particular, we're going to be looking at being impatient with the things that we know that God has for us, but we try to accomplish these things in our own time. Moses inwardly had a very, I believe, God-given desire to free his people. Like I said, he couldn't stand to watch it for one day. First instance that he sees, he springs to action. He had a God-given zeal and a desire, and I believe a God-given instinct to want to free God's people. That's good. That's what he, that was his purpose was. But it wasn't in God's time, and it wasn't in God's direction. So we're going to look at Moses, and then we're going to look at another man, Aaron, his brother, Maybe the same situation kind of happens to him. So let's go to Exodus 32, Exodus chapter 32. We're going to be looking at the life of these two men, Moses and Aaron. Exodus chapter 32. We know that uh, the Lord brings here so far in the book of Exodus up to this point here in 32, we know that the Lord has then brought them out of the land of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai. Uh, God meets with Moses on the mountain. And here in the middle of God meeting with Moses on the mountain, Moses is up there and the Lord's laying out detail after detail and commandment after commandment, you know, 10 chapters of commandments and details for the construction of the temp temple or tabernacle. But in the middle of that, we have Exodus 32, verse number one. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, I have that underlined, out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. That's pretty impatient. You just saw the Lord deliver you out of the land of Egypt, come across the Red Sea, bring you to the mount where you know that God is meeting with them. The Lord asked everybody to come up to the mountain, and they're like, we ain't going up there. There's thunder and lightning, and God's up there, and Moses goes up there by himself. 
So he's up there. Well, Moses was taking a little too long. He's been up there, and we don't know what happened to him. There's still storm clouds and thunder and lightning. So they said, Aaron, make us gods to go before us. Verse number two. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. Verse number three. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which they were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hands and fashioned it with the graving tool. After he had made it, a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel. This is Aaron talking. He said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw, saw it, he built an altar before it and made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Verse number six. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. If you were to read the literally two, three chapters before this, you're going to see that God had already had a position ready for Aaron. And we're going to look at that. But while God was working out the details with Moses saying, hey, here's what I want Aaron to do. Here's what I want Aaron to wear. Here's where he's going to serve. Giving Moses detail after detail of Aaron's position. Aaron's ordained by God position. Aaron... And the people become impatient and they want to have their, that position now. Just as Moses had a desire to free God's people from slavery, Aaron had a desire and the people's respect to be the spiritual leader for the people. God had a specific position and a task for both Moses and Aaron, but his timing was very important. This is, a, this is a statement that I have underlined here. Jumping ahead of God's timing made them a murderer and an idolater rather than a deliverer and the high priest. All because of timing and all because of being impatient for what the Lord had. These men had strong desire to do what God had designed for them to do, but they didn't do it in God's timing. So there's times where God shows us specifically something that he wants to do in our life. He wants us to serve in a certain area or a ministry he wants us to be involved in or maybe even a position that he has for us in the future. And many times God gives us this strong desire, but then we jump ahead of God and we do it in our timing. God's timing is always perfect. Ecclesiastes 3.11, He hath made everything beautiful in His time. Doing what God asks us to do in our own time can create problems for the future, and our efforts will be in vain. So we're going to look at this principle of impatience in the life of Moses and Aaron. First, we see Moses tries to kind of be the deliverer for Israel ahead of what God had designed. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to kind of surmise. We're going to surmise. Let's go to Exodus 2, and we're going to look at Moses being successful in this revolt. This is not with God's direction, God's timing, or God's leadership. This is Moses, the deliverer, in his time, in his strength, okay? Let's surmise that Moses... Uh, is able to lead a revolt and to bring the, Egypt, bring the Hebrews out from the hand of the Egyptians all on his own. There's more Hebrews than there is, than there is uh, Egyptians. So Moses is that zealous leader. They get behind him and they revolt against Egypt and they get out. So let's surmise that that happens. What did Moses miss? Go to Exodus 2, verse 21 and 22. Moses would have missed that whole time where he was in the wilderness the Lord brought him to the wilderness for a particular reason. Moses himself, okay? In verse number 21 and 22 of chapter 2, we see what Moses misses first. And Moses was content to dwell uh, with the man, talking about his future father-in-law, and he gave unto uh, Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bare him a son, called his name Gershom, and said... I and for he has said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So the first thing that Moses would have missed is he would have missed his wife and his child. He never would have had the wife that he had or the child that he had if he would have successfully freed Egypt, the Hebrews from Egypt in his own time. Because he never would have gotten expelled to the desert. So he would have missed that, his wife and son. 
Next, in verse number one of chapter three, we see that Moses would have missed out on some leadership skills as a shepherd, which was going to be very important. So Exodus three, verse one, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the Mount of God, even Horeb. So leadership skills, leading sheep. He needed these skills when he would get to the wilderness with the children of Israel, but surmising that, he led this revolt on his own, he wouldn't have had those skills. Okay, next, Exodus 3, verse number 2, he would have missed the burning bush experience. Verse number 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. He would have missed that amazing experience with God. Okay, Surmising that he leads the children of Israel in a revolt against the Egyptians, there would have been a massive war. So he would have missed out on deliverance without having a massive war with massive casualties. Okay, it would have been an all-out brawl. Okay, because we had the Hebrews living and dwelling among them. It would have been bloody. It would have been awful. But when the Lord delivered them, they actually just took all their stuff and left. Okay, we also would have missed out on the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. We would never would have had that picture. And for Judaism, the Passover, the biggest feast of the year for them, a picture of Christ, Christ sits down and has the Passover. We wouldn't have had the Passover if Moses would have delivered them. We wouldn't have had the spoils of Egypt. I kind of mentioned that in Exodus 12, 35 and 36. And they wouldn't have had the Red Sea experience either. So we understand... And just looking, those are just, I think, what, six or seven things that I highlighted that Moses would have missed out on if he would have actually been able to execute his plan and free Israel. God's timing was very important. Also, let's surmise that Moses, he, he delivers them, he gets them to the wilderness. What does that look like? They are starving, they are thirsty, they are unprotected by day, they are freezing by night and surrounded by enemies. Okay? a very beaten up, broken people that just got out of a civil war and somehow got across the Red Sea. Okay, If Moses was able to deliver the people and get them to the wilderness without the Lord's blessing, the children of Israel and Moses would have most definitely perished. It is easy to think of how outlandish this scenario would be and what it looks like without the Lord, but many times we jump ahead of the Lord and it is just as outlandish for us to do that. His timing is perfect. Okay, let's think about Aaron. Aaron jumps ahead of God and wants to be a high priest. Well, that, what did Aaron miss out without God? He is the priest to a high, he is the high priest to a cow. He leads the people to immorality rather than righteousness. He doesn't get to be a high priest to God and he doesn't have to have, he does, his whole family doesn't get the opportunity to be the high priest to God. Again, very outlandish scenario, but it's the importance of executing God-given desires in God's timing. Okay, Now, we're going to look at, take a little bit deeper dive into God's perfect timing for Moses. So, Exodus 3.1, we see that, that time in the wilderness was a time to learn humility and leadership. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, and it gave him those leadership skills. Okay, Something he also gained by that time in, in uh, the wilderness, is Exodus 2, verse 23, and it came to pass in the process of time. I have that underlined. Exodus 2, verse 23, and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of bondage. This could be significant for many different reasons. That means there was no emotional tie or physical tie between the current Pharaoh and Moses. At the time being, so if he has this revolt, at the time being, it was his, it was his stepdad. Okay, was, There's a strong emotional and physical tie between Moses and this Pharaoh. Well, in that time in the wilderness, God's timing, that Pharaoh dies. So now when Moses returns, there is no animosity between Moses the man Moses and the man Pharaoh. There is also no uh, uh, feelings of love or attachment to Moses. So then, you know, people couldn't surmise, well, 
Pharaoh let the people go because it's, it's his son. You know, of course he's going to let him go. He asked for it. Or quite the opposite. Pharaoh isn't letting the people go because he has animosity against Moses because Moses murdered one of his own, you know, Egyptian brethren. No, with Pharaoh dying, it removed any connection between Moses and Pharaoh, and it was just God versus Pharaoh. That, it needed to happen. With Moses' stepfather out of the picture, it was just God versus Pharaoh. That happened, and as I have underlined in my Bible, in the process of time. Ah. Verse number three, or excuse me, principle number three, Moses gains a faithful man as a father-in-law. We see that when he was keeping uh, his father's flock. His father was the priest in Midian. We see that in verse number one of chapter three and, and uh, in chapter two as well. Later, much later, in Exodus chapter 18, Moses delivered the Israelites. He's in the wilderness, and it's recorded that Moses, he wakes up, and the people start filing up with their problems. Oh, this guy took my chickens. Oh, this guy took this. Oh, this guy took this. And it says that Moses, from the time the sun came up to the time the sun went down, sits there and discusses people's matters and have to be, okay, you're right, you're wrong. Okay, you're right, you're wrong. That's taxing. In chapter 18, Moses gets some amazing organizational and, and judgment uh, advice from his father-in-law. He says, you need to set men over this group, and then in that group you need to set men, and in that group you need to set men. That way you're not, from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, you're not dealing with petty matters. You're doing what the Lord wants you to do, leading the people. And he never would have had that if he wouldn't have had his father-in-law, a faithful, godly man to give him some advice. Okay, He would have missed that. And then obviously tied with his father-in-law would be his wife and his children. Okay, Verse number uh, 19 through 22. We're going to read this of chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 19 through 22. Here's a very important part of God's timing. Exodus chapter 3, verses 19 through 22. This is the Lord telling Moses how this is going to happen. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by the, a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Here, in this whole process of time, the process of the plagues, God is going to strike fear in the heart of the Egyptians. Why? That verse number 21. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons, upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. This all happens in a process of time. God shows his mighty hand through the wonders that he's going to do through the plagues of Egypt. All of this, Moses, if he would have rushed, he would have missed that because it allowed the Egyptians literally to say like, take our stuff, take whatever you want, borrow whatever you want, just get out of here, please. And the other scenario that we played out that doesn't happen. But here, they walk away with everything. Raiment, what they need in the wilderness, gold, silver, what they need to build God's temple and tabernacle and to be able to exchange with other nations. All of that provision comes from God's time. Then, obviously, the Red Sea. In Exodus 14, God uses the Red Sea in his impeccable timing. He uses his awesome power not only as deliverance across the Red Sea, but as a way to defeat the Egyptian armies. All of that is God's impeccable timing. There's just a few obvious examples of God's impeccable timing. We see that in the life of Aaron as well, and I hasten. In that delay, in which in times in our lives we have that delay from God, we see that God was designing a beautiful place for Aaron to work. He was designing a beautiful outfit for Aaron to wear and creating a beautiful picture of God's own son as the high priest, in which Aaron would get to play that role of the high priest as a picture of Jesus Christ. It gives, and he gave Aaron an opportunity, like Moses, to meet with the presence of God in the holiest of holies. Okay, In God's impeccable timing for Aaron, he had a place 
something to, a beautiful outfit to wear, a beautiful picture, and an opportunity to meet with God's presence. Summary is, as a difficult as it is to wait on the Lord in His timing, we have to understand that God is working out everything, whether we can see it or not. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Just because we cannot see the end result or understand the steps to get there and the timing of it, it does not mean that God has forgotten us or that He needs our help to speed these things up. 2 Peter 3, 8, but... Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is as a th- as, as with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. If we are seeking God and loving Him with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and God is still seemingly quiet, He and seemingly has left us with no direction, just know that He is working in the background uh, and is doing something miraculous. And then Isaiah, I'm going to actually just have you do this if you would like. Isaiah 55, just read that chapter. It's 13 verses. And it opens our eyes to see how we forsake trying to do things in our own strength, seek the riches of this world. We understand that God is doing all things in His time. In that passage of Isaiah 55, we have His his ways are not your ways, neither are His thoughts. Your thoughts are so much higher and the joy that that brings. Leaving impatience in Egypt. It's hard sometimes to wait and do seemingly nothing while God is working things in the background. But we need to stay faithful to what he has already asked us to do and and not get impatient, try to jump ahead of the things that we believe God has for us.